welcome to the Performing Arts Series, brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Yvonne Carruthers, your host for today's program. This program is interactive, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions of us later in the broadcast by using the 800 number or the email address, which will appear on your screen. We hope to hear from you. Here with us in the Hilton High School Auditorium are students from Prince William County Public Schools. Welcome to all of you. Here on the stage with me today are members from the National Symphony Orchestra. Let's start with Stephen Dumain, who plays the tuba. <laughs> Yeah. Next, I'd like to introduce Gabrielle Fink, who plays the French horn. I'd like for you to meet Laurent Weibel, who plays the violin. <laughs> and on the cello, Yvonne Carruthers. <laughs> Well, to make our connections between history and music, let's go back to some very, very early musical instruments. Let's start by looking at a bone flute that's thought to be 40,000 years old. These are some ancient flutes found in China, which could be 5,000 years old. And even before Columbus came here in 1492, Native Americans had a rich musical culture here on this continent. First Europeans settled here in Jamestown in 1607, it would have been very quiet. Think about it for a minute. They didn't have many things that we have. Indeed, it would have been very quiet in Jamestown. But those first settlers did bring music with them. They brought their favorite popular songs and hymns. I'm going to play one of those ancient hymns on this instrument called a recorder, one of the earliest instruments here in North America. listen to a popular song in the early colonies.
Now the early colonists brought music with them from Europe, as you've heard. But it would be many years and several generations before there was music that could be called truly American. But by the second half of the 1700s, the colonists were thinking about independence from Great Britain. As you have learned in your history classes, there was conflict between the British and the colonists for several years before war was declared. No one knows where that song came from or even who wrote it, but it was easy to make up words that fit its rhythm. But first, let's think about what does Yankee Doodle mean? Well, Yankee was a word that was used to represent the Dutch settlers in New York, and doodle means simpleton, and macaroni, well, that's a person who's maybe traveled a lot, and when they come home, they try to sort of put on outlandish costumes, <laughs> pretending to be someone a little better than everyone else. But the tune Yankee Doodle was used by both sides, by the British and by the Americans, and they often used the tune to antagonize each other. So let's divide right down the middle, and those of you on that side, you're going to be the British, the Redcoats, and those of you on this side, you're going to be the Americans, the colonists, the Yankees. And you're declaring your independence already. So you Redcoats over there, you're going to sing this, the words that you see on the screen. And Gabe is going to play along. So, OK, just the British are going to sing this. Ready? Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Stuck a feather in his cap with macaroni. Good. Now, all you colonists, you're going to sing a different set of words. Look at these. This is what you're going to sing, and Steve's going to play along with us. Ready? Nanky Doodle came to town upon a little pony with a feather in his hat upon a macaroni. Excellent. Okay, now, after a few victories, the colonists were feeling very bold, and they set these words to the tune. Let's have everybody sing this together. Ready? There was Captain Washington upon a strapping stallion, giving orders to his men. I guess there was a million. Thanks, great. There was also music at the surrender of Yorktown. You would have heard two different bands playing. Gabe is going to represent the British band playing the tune the world turned upside down. an interesting bit of history and music trivia. George Washington and Franz Josef Haydn were both born in 1732. And I know you know who Washington is, but maybe you're not that familiar with Haydn. So I'm going to play, we're going to play 
a piece of music that he became famous for. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of pieces of music. That one became known as the Surprise Symphony because it kind of makes you jump in your seat. And many of his other pieces also got nicknames such as the Clock Symphony, the London Symphony, and the Military Symphony. But usually in classical music, symphonies don't get nicknames. They just get names like Symphony Number no. 4 or Symphony Number no. 11. Well, we're going to turn now to the music of Ben Franklin. You don't usually think about Ben Franklin when you think about music, do you? You think about him discovering that lightning is a form of electricity, and you think about him helping to write the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, but you know what he was most proud of in his life was inventing the instrument that you're going to see on the screen called a glass harmonica. Now, he knew about this, where you could rub your wet finger on a crystal glass and make a note. It's a beautiful sound. But his invention, instead of using glasses, was to use glass bowls. And he turned them on their side and had a, um, a mechanical device that turned the bowls and all you had to do was come along and touch them with your wet finger to make a sound. Now Mozart, a composer, loved this instrument and wrote a piece for it, several pieces, and Marie Antoinette, who was married to the King of France, loved this sound. So Ben Franklin, Mozart, and Marie Antoinette are tied together in history through the sound of the instrument that you're hearing. to jump ahead to the year 1803. Napoleon, the famous French ruler, <laughs> and no, no, this Napoleon, had a lot to do with music without even intending to. Here you see him looking properly heroic. Thomas Jefferson was president at the time, 1803, and Napoleon sold a huge chunk of territory to the United States. We know it as the Louisiana Purchase. It's the green area that you see in the center of the map, and you see Napoleon's signature down in the left-hand corner. It almost doubled the size of the United States. So President Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark on an expedition to explore this territory, hoping to find a river route to the Pacific Ocean. They should have called it the Surprise Expedition. Now, President Jefferson was an excellent violinist. He played for many, many years. There was a violinist, in fact, on the Lewis and Clark expedition. His name was Pierre Cruzat, a former French trader and trapper. 
Known for his wilderness survival skills, but he also played the violin. He would have called it a fiddle. Let's drop in on the expedition as they're getting ready to leave. Howdy, Captain Lewis. Uh, good morning. How is the packing going? Well, we just have a few things left, and I really was hoping we could leave this okay. afternoon. I... Let's see, do we have the blankets yet? The blankets are that pile okay. over there, but... All right. How about the lead? Maybe this is what we've been waiting for. What have okay. you got here? Obviously very heavy. Yeah. Oh. Okay. What is that? That's the last box of lead, Captain. Oh, excellent. Can okay. you just put it over there? That needs to go at the bottom. Okay. Let me see. What else do we have to... Okay. Do we have uh, the, all the clothing yet? Well, I'm... What's this? Hey, voilà. Les chemises. Oh, those are the shirts. Shirts. Okay. Oh, shirts. Okay. Merci those are nice. shirts. That's a bag of shirts. He oh, brought yeah. a bag of shirts. Mm -hmm. Qu'est-ce qu'il veut? Y a un problème? Uh, yes, I have a problem with this. Oh. Quoi? Qu'est-ce qu'il y a? I've been working like a dog all day, and you've got a bag of shirts. Et alors? Il a, il a un problème avec les chemises. Uh -huh. uh, tu comprends? Parce que le plan est assez lourd. Oui, c'est lourd. Et les, les chemises, chemises, pas trop lourdes. Oh, Et moi, l'hiver dernier au Canada, j'en ai porté des pots de castor, j'en ai porté trois fois plus que toi, avec ces gros muscles. Well, he's what is he saying? Voilà. What, what is he, he saying? Does he want to fight me? Whoa. He just explained to me. <laughs> Now, calm down, calm down. He said last year in Canada, you remember that cold, hard winter, he carried tons of beaver pelts all the way through the wilderness. Oh, well, everybody's got their little... Nah, Everybody's got their little story about last winter, but I want to know what good will he be to the exposition, expedition today, right now? And every time I see him around camp, he's got this little sack on his back. Oh. What's in the sack? Oh, what's that? What's in the sack? Oh, what's in the sack? Oh, what's in the sack? It's a good question. Ha. Oh, the oh. guy. It's a fiddle. It's a fiddle? It's mm -hmm. fiddle. Yeah. a fiddle. Well, Fiddle diddle. What good is a fiddle going to do us? He could be carrying some, he could salted fish, some flour, some food. Let me see if more, I can more explain. Beaver pellets, maybe? Let me see if I can explain. I, it's true. We have plenty of supplies, but you don't want to have to carry them all, do you? We hired him for his skills with the natives. He speaks their languages. And I think on those long, cold winter nights, we'll be happy to have a little music. And sure enough, that first winter in North Dakota, it was bitterly cold. Most of the men had never felt temperatures so cold, and Lewis and Clark kept the men busy by having them build this fort at Fort Mandan. And on the long winter nights... The second winter, the second winter was even worse than the first winter. They spent the winter at Fort Clatsop on the Oregon coast where it rained for days at a time and the men's spirits were very low. Oh. Hey, where's Pierre? Maybe we could get him to play for it. It's so cold. I'm sick of this rain. rain. So cold. Hey, Pierre. What? So way back on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in Europe, Napoleon was busy spreading his empire by conquering other countries. 
And pretty soon, he declared himself emperor. And Beethoven, the composer, he was writing a symphony that he had dedicated to Napoleon, thinking that Napoleon was going to lead Europe into a more democratic age. But once Beethoven learned that Napoleon declared himself emperor, he took the title page to the symphony and scratched Napoleon's name off of it, and he retitled the piece The Heroic Symphony. And this next piece we're going to play is a section from Beethoven's Heroic Symphony that he wrote in 1803. the U.S. and England were battling again. The British had even attacked the new capital of our country, and they burned the White House in Washington, D.C. That was a humiliating moment for our nation. The British headed next to Baltimore, an important harbor at the head of Chesapeake Bay. Francis Scott Key watched the bombardment of Fort McHenry in Baltimore, and um, at the end of the battle, he saw that the U.S. flag was still flying. And he was so grateful and inspired that he wrote a poem about it. And then he realized that that poem would fit in with a tune that was popular at the time. And I'm going to play that tune for you. summed up the patriotic spirit of the day, and his new song was soon published. We're going to play that original version of what later became known as our national anthem, and you'll hear that it's almost the same version that gets played today. Now, you don't need to stand up, but if you would like to quietly sing along with us, you'll be able to read the words on the screen, the original words, a little bit different than what we sing today, as Laurent and I play the original Star Spangled Banner. At the same time, 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia, but when he got to Moscow, he found the city in flames. He was forced to retreat, since there was no way for his army to survive the cold Russian winter without food or shelter. But most of his men did not survive the trip back to France. Out of 500,000 soldiers who had set out, 
Fewer than 20,000 made it back to France. Years later, in the 1880s, the Russian composer Tchaikovsky immortalized those events with this music. <laughs> music before, you're absolutely right, because it gets played every 4th of July during the fireworks. How ironic that here in the United States we start our independence celebrations, Independence Day celebrations, with an old British song, that's the national anthem, and we end every 4th of July with fireworks and a piece of music written by a Russian to celebrate the defeat of the French back in 1812. Well, now we jump ahead to the year, end of the 1800s to composer Antonin Dvorak. He was a Czech citizen, and he was invited to come to New York City to head a school of music. One of his students, a young man named Harry Burley, was introduced to Dvorak and sang American spirituals for him. Dvorak asked Mr. Burley to sing spirituals for him frequently. Not very many months later, Dvorak found himself writing a symphony. It's known today as the New World Symphony, and some people think that a bit of the music in that symphony was inspired by him listening to Harry Burley singing those spirituals. We're going to play a very slow section of Dvorak's New World Symphony.
In the year 1893, there was a World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, and it marked the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus landing in the New World. There were many marvels to look at, including those you see here on the screen. Dvorak conducted an orchestra at the exposition, and thousands of Czech immigrants came to hear him play. Around this time, a new type of music was being born, ragtime. Ragtime led to jazz, and jazz was soon heard all around the world. And this was the first time that music was exported from America. That's Gabe, our horn player, playing the piano. later there was another exposition in St. Louis. This one marked the 100th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And again there were amazing things to see and hear, even to taste. Scott Joplin's music and his fame was spreading quickly. He wrote a piece for that exposition called Cascades in honor of all the fountains at the fair. And while we're playing Cascades, I'd like to invite those of you in the viewing audience to start calling in your questions on the 800 number or the email address that you see on your TV screen, because we look forward to answering those questions after we play Scott Joplin's Cascades. <laughs> turn to some questions from all of you and I see that we have an email question somebody was busy while we were playing the cascades and the email question is when was your instrument invented I'm gonna guess that they're that they mean the tuba well I can tell you that the tuba was invented in the year 1835 in a part of Europe that is now Germany but it was Prussia before um, that's kind of an unfortunate thing for, for tuba players sometimes, that, that it was invented in 1835, because a lot of the big composers like Beethoven, Mozart, J.S. Bach, Haydn, none of these guys were able to write for the tuba because the tuba hadn't been invented yet. 
So a lot of times when I'm at work with the National Symphony Orchestra, I don't have to play because there's just, there's just no tuba part. <laughs> uh, we have an audience question. Go ahead, please. What is the difference between a fiddle and a violin? The, what is the difference between a fiddle and a violin? Laurent, you're going to have to tell them. Well, actually, I can show you that there is no difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, actually, well, it's the same instrument. It's just the way you play that's different. So the reason why I'm using this one is because I had to put it in a bag, so it's a cheap one, and this is the nice, expensive one, so that's why. But can, can you show them some of the differences, like, like they yeah. hold it so differently, when you, right? Yeah, like if you play the violin, like I just did, you just, you hold it, you use a, usually a chin rest, like this device that you put here, that I have to put back now if I want to play. <laughs> but you, you keep it tucked well under your neck, right? Yeah. That's the idea, is that it's held firmly. So you just, you play like this. And no. usually you, you hold it pretty high. If you play the fiddle, you don't usually use one of those. And you just, it's usually held pretty low and... So that, the way you hold the violin and the style of playing is different, so... Yeah, it's a great it. question. Uh, we have an email question that says, what is your favorite piece to play? Gabe, do you have a favorite piece to play? Well, I really love the composer Brahms. And when I play Brahms, my favorite thing to play is the Fourth Symphony by Brahms. Because it has great horn parts? or Great horn parts, and it's a beautiful piece. Everybody sounds good on it. How about you, Steve? Do you have a favorite piece? My favorite piece is whatever I happen to be playing at that time. <laughs> That's what I always say, too. How about you, Laurent? I think I'll agree with Steve. I mean, there, there are a few pieces that I really hate, so I would, I would go with that, like whatever I'm playing at the time. Yeah, that's good. All right, I think we now have a question from the audience. Please go ahead. Why do you put your hand inside the, horn, uh, inside the end of the horn? Why do you put your hand inside of the horn? Maybe you can stand up and sure. demonstrate. Turn around. I can explain to you why I put my hand inside the bell. If I play like this, I'm fine. If I don't have my hand inside the bell, I can't hold my horn up. So that's one of the reasons. But there's also another reason, and that is the sound of the instrument. If I play um, just normally, I'll show you. My hand is in there. You can see it. You see it's nice and mellow, and the sound is soft and beautiful. If I take my hand out of the bell, it's just a little harsher. It sounds a little better. Can you show them how you change the pitch with your hand sometimes? Because that's kind of a cool... Sure. I like that. So I better do it right, right? <laughs> and we now have an email question that says, do you also play popular music and or jazz? I, I like to play rock music on my tuba sometimes. <laughs> oh. question. Go ahead, please. Can you tell us about each of your instruments? Tell us about each of your instruments. Oof. Do you have a good story about your violin? Like, is it old? And Yeah, actually, well, my violin was made in um, 1782. So... So that's 50 years after... Imagine that. 50 years Haydn, after Haydn Washington and Haydn old. were born. Yeah. And it was made in um, Amsterdam, Holland. So um, I got this violin about 10 years ago. And it's, I don't know if some of you may have seen the red violin, this movie about, yeah, about a, a violin. So it's just, you know, more than 200 years. And I don't know what happened to it, but I'm very glad to, to have it now. Gabe, do you have a great story about your horn? Great story about my horn. You have all kind of fancy decoration on the edge of it. What's that for? Well, I got my horn just recently. It's a very new horn. It's about two years old, but the horn itself, 
the idea of the horn is very old. Horns have been used, I think, ever since prehistory um, in all kinds of settings. This kind of horn was used for hunting expeditions in Europe. People would send signals to each other through the woods since they didn't have cell phones or walkie-talkies. They would use the horn to communicate, and so they'd be riding on their horseback, and they would play things like and so you would hear that and then know the signal for we found an animal or something <laughs> like that. So the horn is pretty old. How about you, Steve? You got a good tuba story? Well, I don't really have a story about my tuba, but I can answer some of the... Whenever I talk to audience members, people are usually really inquisitive about the tuba. So I'll just answer some of the most popular questions about, I get about my tuba. Everybody always asks, how much does your tuba weigh? Well, it weighs about 20, 25 pounds, something like that. It's not that heavy. It's just, it's hollow, so it's a lot lighter than it looks. Um, a lot of people ask me, how much did your tuba cost? Well, this tuba, uh, this one cost $17,000. So it's like a car. Actually, brass instruments, the French horn, the tuba, the trumpet, the trombone are pretty inexpensive, pretty cheap compared to violins or cellos or any other stringed instrument for that matter. Um, I know people who have a mortgage for their violin. Hundreds of thousands of dollars you can pay for a violin. Laurent, how much was your violin? Well, it's not that much, but it's still about $60,000. So that's like, you could get like a, a Mercedes for $60,000. We have another question that says, how many musicians are in the NSO? And the answer to that one is about 100. We wouldn't, we wouldn't all fit here. What was that? We're just a small group of We're them. We're just a small group. And the next email question says, how high and how low can each instrument play? Laurent, let's have a showdown here. How high can you go? Can you uh -huh. play this note? That's low. Oh, come on. How about this one? All right, play Can us a high play note. That one? Play us a high note. Okay, you win. Who plays the lowest? Can you play a low note? I can play a note that's so low that it doesn't even sound like a note anymore. Let's hear it. <laughs> All right, we have another question from the audience here. How much do you practice each day? How much do you practice ah, each day? Gabe, how much question. do you practice? Well, it depends. If I have something very, very difficult coming up, I try to use my time really well. And I don't only practice if I have a piece that I want to learn. I look at the music on the page, and I listen to a recording of it. And sometimes I just sit and think about it. So all of that together, plus picking up the instrument and actually practicing it, could take several hours a day. But sometimes if I don't have so much work, I just maintain my regular routine. So well, it really depends. A couple of years ago, Laurent was working on a big competition. And I know he was practicing a lot. How much were you practicing during your competition preparation days? Well, probably like five to six hours a day. But then, then you have to add you know, rehearsal time with the orchestra and then with the groups like this one. So it can be up to like 10 hours a day playing the violin. We have an email question that said, what made you decide to become a professional musician? Answer number one, it wasn't the money. <laughs> Why do you answer that? Go ahead. Um, I don't even, I don't really remember. I was about 16 and, and you know, you're like a junior in high school and they're always asking you, what are you gonna do for a career? And I had several things that I was thinking about and as I thought of it, I thought to myself, what is the most challenging for me to do? And it, the answer really became playing the cello because it was so hard for me that every day when I sat down to practice, I knew I was never going to be able to do it perfectly. And I liked that idea that it was something that was going to challenge me for the rest of my life. And I think that was kind of what inspired me to try to become a professional musician. And we have another email question. Um, what makes you decide that a piece of music is classical music? That's a tough question. 
Well, popular music we know is new all the time, right? You, there's probably a piece of music that's being released today, and it might be popular for a month, a day, a week. But the music that we play, as you've heard, some of it is several centuries old. And it's, what else would you add to that? Well, who writes the music is a pretty big determining factor in what style of music it is, too. That's true. All right, we have another audience question. How long have you been playing your instrument? How long have you been playing your That's instrument? A good oh, I love that one. Huh. Laurent, when did you start playing the violin? Um, I started when I was six, and I'm 33, so you do the math. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, how old were you when you started playing the French horn? Well, when I started playing the French horn, I was about 10 years old, and I was in the regular middle school band in fifth grade, and I started that way. I started when I was in sixth grade, and I was, uh, I was 12 years old, so I've been, playing, I've been playing for 20 years. I started playing the cello when I was nine, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> we have another audience question. Do you play more than one instrument? Do we play more than one instrument? Well, you heard Gabe play the piano, so we can vouch for her. And I, I played the recorder. <laughs> no, seriously, that's the only thing I even try. Well, I play, I can play the viola, which uh, you probably know viola is like just like the violin, but a little bigger, and it sounds lower, so I can play that. How about you, Steve? You play anything else? No, I just play the tuba. How many of you play an instrument? How many, how many of you, wait, wait, wait. Let me say that again. How many of you play the flute? We've got a lot of flute players. How about clarinet? How many of you play the violin? Oh, excellent. Does anybody play the tuba? Hey, great. Anybody play the French horn? How about the cello? Yeah, great stuff. Okay, we have Another audience question? Is it hard to play the tuba? Is it hard to play the tuba? No. Well, since I've, <laughs> since I've been playing the tuba for about 20 years, it's not that hard anymore. Although, uh, when I first started out, it was pretty tough. I, sometimes I would get lightheaded because it takes a lot of wind. But now I'm pretty used to it. It's not as hard as it used to be. But it depends on what kind of piece I'm going to play. If I'm going to, well, in a few minutes, you'll hear me play a piece. That's pretty hard. So it depends on what you're playing, too. Our next question is from email, and it says, do you travel abroad to play? And the answer is yes. The National Symphony is 75 years old this year, and we have given many, many concerts in foreign countries. I have not been to Africa yet, and I've not been to Australia, but I've been to all the other continents, and it's all because of music. So yeah, we do quite a bit. We have another question from, no, that's the one we just answered, sorry. Okay, right here in the audience. Where does the National, uh, where does the National Symphony Orchestra perform? Where does the National Symphony Orchestra perform? We perform at the Kennedy Center. How many of you have ever been to the Kennedy Center? Very good, so you know we're up there along the Potomac River, don't you? Okay. Do we have any more questions here in the audience? We have a caller. We have a caller from St. Louis. Caller, you're on the air. Give us your question, please. Yes, thank you. This is Teach, ma'am. Yes. Are you talking to me? Yes, please go ahead with your question. Um, this is Teacher Terry from Robinson School District, first through technically kindergarten to fourth grade. And the students here who play music in the musical classes want to know if any of you ever played what's known as a juice harp. Have any of us ever played a juice harp? Is that the question? Yes. I've tried to, and I'm not very good at it. Have you guys ever tried? No. You know, it, I tried once, and it really hurt my teeth. The vibrations <laughs> hurt. It's a, it's a funny little instrument that you have to position exactly right in your mouth, and then you play it with one finger. It's, it's really tricky. It's kind of fun, though. We have an audience question right here. What musicians have inspired you? What musicians have inspired you? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Well, when I was your age and just starting out, I had a private teacher that showed me how to play my tuba. He was a big inspiration. Also, my high school band director, a guy named Mark Blanchett, 
was a very, very big inspiration. And also I had an orchestra, a youth orchestra director named Mr. Pandolfi. Very, very big inspirations for me. How about you, Gabe? Did you have an inspiration? Well, I am a big fan of the pianist, Emmanuel Axe. You maybe have heard of him. I think he's a wonderful pianist. Um, there's a couple other famous people, like um, the late cellist, Jacqueline Dupre, is a great musician. And those are my two favorites. Laurent, did you have any inspiring? Oh my god, I have a lot of uh, people who inspired me, but I would say uh, as a violinist, uh, David Oistrak is for me the greatest. And also I have to say I like jazz, and Miles Davis is to me one of the best musicians Great. that I know. We have a quick email question. We're just about to the end of our question period. And it's, it's an email that says, my son just started playing the trombone and he's made first chair and what would be the next instrument that he ought to start playing? Should he maybe try the tuba? Would that be logical if you're playing the trombone? Sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> if, he okay. wants to, if he wants to go something that uh, has a smaller mouthpiece, he could go to the trumpet. I'd like to thank the students in the auditorium for being with us today and the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into our program. I especially want to thank my colleagues from the NSO, Stephen Dumain, Gabrielle Fink and Laurent Weibel. Now, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question today, you can still contact us by using the email address on the screen. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll try to answer your question about either today's program or upcoming broadcasts. We also invite you to visit the Kennedy Center website at the address on the screen for more information about upcoming programs, as well as finding other resources for integrating the arts into your curriculum. The next program in this series will be broadcast via satellite and the web on Friday, October 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and features members of the Shanghai Song and Dance Ensemble performing ethnic dance dramas traditional in Chinese culture. We have one more connection to make between history and music. We've been talking about many historical events, wars or expeditions, or we've given you lots of names and dates. In the 20th century, it's hard to choose which event would be the most important. There were famous scientists such as Albert Einstein or Marie Curie, and they taught us that the invisible world held many great secrets. Artists such as Picasso and Salvador Dali showed us that the world could be looked at in many different ways as well. Of course, there were the usual bad guys. These two were probably among the worst. But luckily, they were balanced by a number of wonderful people, such as Gandhi and Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela, who tried to make the world a better place to live in. But in the world of music, there's one event that really stands out in the 20th century. And that's the moment when music and pictures came together in film. And if you've ever pushed the mute button on your TV set during a commercial, then you know what it was like to watch those old silent films. In fact, you might try that this afternoon when you go home. You turn on the TV, but leave the sound off and see if you find it half as entertaining. But have you ever done the opposite? Have you ever listened to a piece of music and tried to make up a story to go with it? Well, you're going to have a chance to do that as we end our program today because Steve brought us a piece of music for solo tuba. And as we play it, we invite you to try to come up with a scene of your own to go with it. Maybe one of you is the next Steven Spielberg. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. 